All right, I'll talk to you later. Hello, Minister Demita. Hi. Hello, Minister Demita. Hey, Mr. Nolan, how are you? Good, well. Good. I see you got a haircut. <laughs> Put me out in the cold. <laughs> I want the moon. All right. On me. Can I take two? Okay, we are just starting to get everybody in here. So I'm gonna give it just another second here. Um, it's so good to see everybody tonight. Mm -hmm. So good to, to be sharing the word with you and excited to just be delivering what, what God's got. And um, I know it's gonna be a great word because tonight of all nights was the only time we've ever had technical issues getting on Zoom. So I'm like, okay, all right, I see you. Okay. You know, but God will always make a way. So let's go before the Lord in prayer real quick. Um, and then we're going to dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for continuing to pour out into our lives, for taking out of your reserve in heaven to deposit into our lives each and every day. We thank you for continuing to bless us, to work with us, to walk with us and to be with us. We thank you that you are our Emmanuel, God with us, that you never leave us or forsake us, and that you continue to feed us day in day and day out. God, feed us right now in this moment. I pray that each and every person who is here today will walk away with something that changes their life forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So those of you who have gotten to hear me uh, hear me teach before you know I like a lot of interactions so I'm going to be looking for you to use the chat I need you to you know get in here answer questions come off mute all that good stuff okay we're going to roll tonight so I'm going to pick up in Proverbs 4 which is where Minister Durrell left off last week and I'd like to get someone to read for me out of the New Living Translation um, starting in verse 20 can I get a volunteer to do that I don't have that version, Minister Demeter. Okay. Does somebody have the New Living Translation? I do. Okay. Would you mind reading verses uh, 20 through 23 for me out of uh, Proverbs 4? What verses again? Start at verse 20 and then we'll end at verse 23. Okay. Verse 20. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay we're going to pause right there. Ms. Beverly, we're going to pause right there. Okay. Um, so I need you to, to think about this as if you were reading it to your child. If you were saying it to your child, how would you say it? You know, I would say something like, don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart for they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. That's what my words can do. Does that make anybody think of a particular scripture? Does that remind anybody of a scripture you've heard before? Come on, where's my Bible scholars? Something about the word being in your heart? Come on, y'all, wake up. <laughs> I, don't. I think I got it. Go ahead. My, my, word, my word I've hidden in your heart, so I might not sin against you. Your word have I hidden in my heart, yeah. so that I might not sin against you. 
right? Yeah. And I got another one. Oh, I think um, Minister Daly, you're, you're speaking, but you're on mute. I was gonna say, uh, first thing that came to my mind is, um, that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Yes. Amen. Okay, anybody else? Um, uh, would the, um, the scripture for my words of spirit and their life be fitting here? Absolutely. Jesus said to his disciples, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And that is John 6 and 63. Um, and I love something that I found in, in Romans 8 and 10. It says the spirit is life because of righteousness. I want you to think about that. That the more you walk in righteousness, the more you let the spirit operate in you. And the more you let the spirit operate, the more you have the abundant life that Christ died to give you. Um, it also makes me think of something that John wrote. And this is uh, 3 John verse, or chapter 1, starting in verse 2. He says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And so a lot of us know that verse, that's verse two, right? But here's what he says after that. He says, for I rejoiced greatly when the brethren testified of the truth that is in you, even as you walk in the truth. So think about that for a second. So not only is the truth in you, but you're in the truth. Right? Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. I abide in you, you abide in me. That's how we have life. And so as we're talking about these concepts of knowledge and wisdom and understanding, right? There are people who have knowledge, but don't know what to do with it. Anybody ever met somebody like that? Right? Then you have people who have wisdom, but don't have knowledge. Anybody ever met somebody like that? Right. I can tell you my grandfather was one of the wisest people I have ever met. And he just got out of high school. Right? And I know people with master's degrees that he could run circles around because of the wisdom that was in him. And in fact, the Bible talks about people who will be the same way when it comes to the word. Romans 2 and 14 says, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, meaning they don't have the knowledge, but by nature, they're doing it. By instinct, they're doing it. These, having not the law, become a law unto themselves. Meaning you've got people who know how to apply what you know, but you're not applying it. That's all of what he's talking about in Romans 2. And what a shame that would be for us as Christians to have all this knowledge of the word, but somebody else is out there applying what we know. And we're not getting the life out of it because we're not applying what we know. There are people who are rich today that are atheists because they went through Proverbs and read it and they're doing what it says. But you got broke Christians all over the world because they're just applying the principles. That's it, right? They're applying the things that we know. And so as we are looking at what we're doing, we want to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We want to take this thing and run with it and make it real. And it shouldn't just be real for us. It should also be real for the people around us. So I want you guys to take a minute 
and go with me to second Corinthians. We'll start in chapter two, verse 17. And I'd like somebody to read for me out of the King James version. Can I get a volunteer to I'll do that? You. Thank you, sir. I got you. Um, so just a quick note on this, and this is something to always, always remember, okay? When you are reading the Bible, do not ever let the chapter headings, the scripture stopping, stop you. That was all done and put in the chapters, the verse, verse numbers, all of that was put in to help you better digest the Bible. But that doesn't mean that's the end of what somebody was saying. So I'm going to have you start, Dustin, and read verse 17 for me, which is the end of chapter two. And then I need you to read the first three verses of chapter three. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So sorry, 17, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. It says, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Hello? Mm -hmm. Is my thing lagging? I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, did you guys hear what I said, or do I need to repeat it? No, you're good. Okay. Do you want me to go to the next first, or you want to? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry, my system is lagging really bad. It says, uh, do we, all right, verse one says, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of condemnation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men, for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with the ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in the tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of the heart. Amen. And such trust have we through Christ to God word. Not that we are so. Okay, cool. Good deal. So what was he saying? Somebody tell me what, what he was saying. What does that mean? That, oh, um, that pretty much the word of God wasn't written just to be um, put on ink with, I mean, wasn't written just to be put on paper by ink, but it was written to be put engraved into our hearts almost like stones so that we can recall whenever we need it. And um, we should be able to look it up the same way we'll be able to look it up on paper in our hearts. Yeah, right. That's why I started this asking you, okay, you hear a scripture. What other scripture does that make you think of, right? If you read Paul's writing over and over again, He's literally taking the scriptures that he already knows and then explaining them with the context that Christ has given. He's taking what's already in his heart and giving it to you in a way that you can understand it and you can grab the meaning out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we should always be doing with the word. That's what we strive to do here at Frontier Church, right? That you wouldn't just see words on a page but you would see life lived in a way that makes a difference. And here's an, an interesting thing that he says. He talks about letters of commendation and what they used to do in the old church, um, in the early days of the church, I should say. Um, and you'll see this a couple of times with Paul writing um, to a church and saying, hey, when this person comes to you, receive them because they're coming from me, okay? Um, you see that consistently in, in several places or this person is bringing this letter on my behalf. It's a real letter, you know, receive this. And that was a tradition within the early church. 
And here's what Paul is saying in second Corinthians. He says, I don't need a letter, or at least I shouldn't need a letter of recommendation. You're my letter. All right. What does that tell you as a student of this church? That at the end of the day, bishops shouldn't need a letter of recommendation. Your minister shouldn't need a letter of recommendation. You should be able to be a living epistle of what you've been taught here, of what's been ingrained in you and what's been engraved on your heart, which you have to allow that engraving process. Amen? At the end of the day, your life should be able to be, as Paul said, read of all men. People are seeing you day in and day out. And what they see of you gives them an impression of your God and of your church, of your family, of the things you've learned, of the things you've been taught. And so the father in, in Proverbs is basically like, don't go out there embarrassing me. You know how we act, you know how we do, do it right, right? But Paul says, basically, you should know who you represent when you go out. You should know who you represent by what you're doing and by how you're doing it. How you've been trained should show up in how you train others, should show up in how you talk to others in the kind of person who you are and the kind of person who you aspire to be. Amen? So we're gonna go back and look at Proverbs 4 again. And I wanna read this to you. Um, we'll start in verse no, 24. That was not all. And I wanna read this to you out of the um, NASB version, okay? This says, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put devious speech far from you. So what's the difference between deviousness and deceit? Anybody tell me? Minister Durant looking like he's waiting on his answer. <laughs> um, I would say deviousness is probably unrestrained and deceitfulness probably has like a certain type of cover. Mm. Good answer. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I would say, like Mr. Durant said, uh, deviousness is like parting away from what is right, parting away from, you know, the right way. And um, deceit, like you said, is like covering up, making it like look brand new, but it's not, it's a little run down. So yeah. Right. So deceit just is like bold face lie, right? Like you didn't even try to cover it. You just straight up lied, right? Deviousness is more about corrupting the truth. Just changing it just, just a little bit. Just, you know, the cup fell on the floor, but you don't need to know that I helped it on the way there. So I'm gonna just say the cup fell and it spilled everything everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's that, that little twisting of the truth that may be for my benefit or the benefit of someone else but it keeps you from being 100% honest, right? And so when this father is speaking to his son, he says, put that away from you. Don't let that even be something you do. It's not about if it's a big lie or a little white lie. It's a lie at the end of the day. And if you're going to walk in righteousness, Let's walk right. Let's walk in truth. 
you know, as John said, you're experiencing even health in your body because of the truth you walk in. Mm. Think about that. The truth you walk in will make you free. But the lies you walk in will keep you in bondage. The lies you walk in will keep you in fear and stress and distress. Trust me, I know because I've been there. <laughs> you got to lie to cover up the lie. And then you got to remember the lie so you can cover up the next one. Right? There are cycles God never intended for us to be in. If we would just walk in truth. The next piece of advice that he gives in verse 25 is look straight ahead, fix your eyes on what lies before you. Make out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Do not get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. And that always makes me think of Jesus saying narrow was the way. It's about this big, right? Wide is the path to destruction. Looks like everybody can get on it. Everybody's welcome on the path to destruction. But narrow is the way, his way, his path, and the path that he intended for you to be on. Mm. So as we're looking at why we should stay on that path, why we should keep his way, and do things his way. I'd like for somebody to read for me Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14. And we're going to read verses 14 through 18. I can read it if no one wants to. I can read it. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Callie, go ahead. Okay, I can go. <laughs> um, so 14, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it. Turn away from it and pass on. Okay, so they pass cannot right. pause right there for a second. Does that make anybody think of, of another scripture? Right. There's one verse that says flee from the very appearance of evil. Right. Anybody think of another one? Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yes. And that is one of my favorites, and I think it's so applicable here. Because people often quote that resist the devil and he will flee, but they forget the submit to God part. <laughs> right? But submitting to God is what gives you the power, the authority, and the strength to resist the devil. And that's why he has to flee. Right? So, Callie, if you'll keep reading for us. Uh, where did you want me to stop? Uh, go ahead and verse 16, um, read 16 and 17 for me. All right. For they cannot sleep unless they do evil, and they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone out or someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. Here's the problem with hanging out with evil people. They do evil things. I had somebody call me once and someone who they knew wasn't walking in righteousness had done something that hurt their feelings. And they called me and they're telling me all about what this person did. And when they finished everything, I said, and? And they looked at me like, what, what do you mean? I said, didn't God tell you to leave them alone? 
didn't you already know they were going to act like this because they're not walking in righteousness? What fellowship has light with darkness? Evil will always hurt you because it's coming to hurt you. It is out to get you, right? It's not playing with you or your life. Like I remember this sermon that um, <laughs> T.D. Jakes did a while back called Patty Cake, and you can probably find it you know, on YouTube. But he literally was like, there's plenty of us out here playing Patty Cake with the devil. And then he gets you out just far enough. And then he swoops you up and he's got you. Why? Because you were over here in the past of evil men. And you just, you thought it was a little, and then maybe a little more, and then a little more. And then all of a sudden, you're way out there. And you don't even know how you got out there. And in the example, there's this dude who's probably like my height, right? Who's like five foot in a snap next to TD Jakes, who's looks like seven feet tall on the TV, right? And TD Jakes just picks him up like manhandles and put him, puts him over his shoulder, right? Most hilarious thing I've ever seen. But the point is that that's how, that is exactly what the devil would do to you. While you're in the midst of righteousness and doing what you're supposed to do, he can't touch you. He can't do anything to you. But if you walk away, if you leave, right? If you decide, I don't like my covering anymore, or I don't want to operate in submitting to God, then you put yourself in his playground where he makes the rules. And trust me, the rules are always changing. And they are never for your benefit. As you're walking in wisdom, as you're walking in knowledge, as you're walking in understanding, right? God is trying to keep you from those kinds of things. He's trying to keep you out of stress you don't have to have in your life. He's trying to keep you from having to recover from something. Not just stop it on the front end. Right? Then we're all better off. You and all the people around you. Because you know you got people around you who worry about you. Right? So as we're dealing with people, remember that the way you walk is going to determine who you're around. And the people you're around are going to help determine what you do. Being mindful of where you're going and how you're getting there makes all the difference when you're dealing with God. It's not a simple, you know, putting puzzle pieces together. It is submitting to him one day after another, one choice after another. You know, as it says in, in verse 25, keeping your eyes fixed straight ahead of you on the path that he has for you so that you can become everything that he's called you to be. So I'd like to get a volunteer to read um, verse 18 for me. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Amen. Just 18 or keep going? Yep, just 18. Okay. You're good. And so as he's talking about what it means to be righteous, right? Just imagine that. Just I want everybody to close your eyes for a minute and imagine the first light of dawn. Some of you don't go to sleep till then. Some of you wake up then, right? But what does that first, first moment of dawn look like in your mind? Somebody share that with me. Um, so for me, when I like imagine it, it's like, it's really cool and the air is crisp. And like the first time that you see it, it's like everything kind of just lights up and it's like a new day or has officially started. Mm -hmm. 
for me, I see like the uh, the light invading, almost like making its way into the night, and infiltrating it. If I may interject, <laughs> of course, dear father. <laughs> I'm speaking from a military point of view. The first, the first time that you opened your eyes, it was called stand to. And what that was while you're in your, while in your foxhole, that's at the time where you can see and the time where you're most vulnerable and the enemy is most vulnerable. So it's kind of, we would always be ready right before the sun would come up it's still dark, but as soon as the sun comes up, you have that light fog, but it was now time to do battle. And to me, it's like a life lesson, which means that you're ready for anything that's going to come at you. You can see them coming, but they can see you too. So you had to be ready. So that's what it was to me. Ms. Tanya, you had something you wanted to share? Well, I would say um, like the breaking of dawn to me, it's just that time when, as when the day is beginning, where it's still, as you say, a little foggy. And like uh, Dustin was saying, how it's just the infiltration of the beginning of day, where it's like that night season is over and day is just about to come. So to me, it's a great, uh, it's a great time. <laughs> Um, for me, um, this is Miss Janita. Um, for me, when I see the breaking of, uh, did you say the breaking of day? Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that to me is um, like a refreshing um, because there is light on a day that we have, or I have never seen before. And mm -hmm. I rejoice because I got a new mercy today. And it wasn't like yesterday. It's a new day, a new mercy, and I can get up and rejoice. That's one of the reasons that I like morning, doing more of a morning person. I, I, like, I like it because the light, the darkness is actually, when the light comes in, it penetrates. It penetrates that darkness. I mean, it just cuts through that darkness, like, it's, sometimes it's just inexplicable. You, you, you can't explain it. I mean, it's just such a beautiful sight to behold. Amen. I absolutely love dawns and sunsets. It's just one of my things. And I always tell people, I like to wake up before the birds know that it's morning you know, in those three, four, five o'clock kind of time frame, because I feel like the earth is still, it's almost like that moment in, in Genesis where the earth is formless and void and there's nothing going on but me and God, that's how it feels. And then when the first little bit of light comes in, I know it's time to move, it's time to go, right? And that's the start of my day. I'll usually start my day, you know, really officially when the sun comes up. And so when I think of this verse, I think of it, um, you know, for me, just considering how bright and beautiful the path of righteousness is, that it gets brighter and brighter as you walk down the path. Right? It gets more and more lovely, more and more beautiful, more and more interesting as you walk down that path. But then I also think of it as... Jesus being the dawn of our righteousness, that that was the first light that the world saw. And even though it didn't understand what was going on, that there will be a full day that comes when he is the light for the new kingdom. Or Revelation says that, that we don't, there's no day or night anymore because he is the light. There is a full day coming for us, but until we get there, we've got to keep walking into brighter and brighter places, keep moving into greater and greater things in him and showing people what it is that our God is really about. So 
the next part that I wanted to share with you guys is just a little bit um, out of Proverbs 5. If I can get somebody to read the first two verses for me out of Proverbs 5. Uh, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Amen. So there's those three key words that we keep talking about, right? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Does anybody remember the definitions that Bishop gave us for those? Anybody? Knowledge is, knowledge is bits and pieces of information. Mm -hmm. And wisdom? I know uh, wisdom is the application of knowledge. And understanding is the full picture. Mm -hmm. It's being able to grab the full picture, right? My prayer for us is that we would be like Jesus' disciples and, the, and that we would grab it a little bit sooner than they did. Because, you know, you read somebody else's story and you're like, man, you still didn't get it. You still didn't get it. But you realize they're living in the moment. How many of us are living in our moments and there's something that God's trying to teach us that somebody else looking at our life would be able to say, oh, man, you didn't see that? But you don't see it yourself, right? But it's when you grab hold of knowledge, wisdom, understanding, that you can step back and see from God's perspective, what's really going on, whether that's in your life or in someone else's. And so my prayer for us is that God would give us all three. He gave his disciples knowledge when he walked with them on the earth. He showed them through practical examples every day, how to walk out the knowledge he had given them. You know, he didn't just say, oh, I give you power over unclean spirits. spirits. He sent them out to do it. Right. Then in the upper room, he breathed on them, giving them the Holy Spirit. And he gave, he opened their understanding to the scriptures to understand who he was. Because even up until that moment, I mean, we give Thomas a pretty hard time. But when you go read the story, Thomas wasn't the only one who doubted. They all doubted. That's why Peter and John ran to the grave because they wanted to see for themselves, right? It wasn't until he opened their understanding that they went, oh, all those scriptures that were talking about you really were talking about you. And this is how these dots connect. And oh, that makes so much sense now. And right, I'm praying for those moments for each and every one of us that we would take hold of this and really dive into not just his word, but the application of his word and then how it all fits together for us, that we make those connections between what he's saying in the New Testament and what he's saying in the Old Testament. You know, One of the most beautiful things that I have ever come across in the Bible um, was we talk about the whole armor of God, right? We talk about um, putting on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, right? But then if you look in the Old Testament, there's actually an instance where God himself says, I looked around and I couldn't find anybody to stand up for me. And this is out of Isaiah 59 and 17. So it says, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. So to understand that our God didn't just give us armor, he actually gave us his armor. When Paul says we put on the full armor of God, it literally was God's armor. Right? Moments like that will completely change how you understand your God and how you receive what he says to you. 
And so my challenge to you is to look in your study for those moments when he connects something that you never would have thought of before. When he shows you that bigger picture, let your eyes be open. When he gives you that knowledge, that wisdom, let your heart be open to receive it and then to guard it there. Verse 23 out of the um, you know, King out of the New King James says, guard your heart, because out of it flow the issues of life. Literally, the life in the life you live. Do you know, a lot of us know what it's like to be alive, but not really living. We know how to exist, but you're not really living. That's the difference in what you put in your heart versus what you live. And Jesus said to us that it's, out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So what you have in abundant supply on the inside is what you're gonna talk about. And what you talk, you walk. What you walk, you live. So this whole journey, this whole study is about helping you, helping all of us really to live better because we know better, amen? So I'm gonna do um, a prayer over all of us. I, I'm looking forward to the testimonies that God's gonna give each and every one of you because I know that he is going to make a difference in each and every one of our lives. Um, so Victoria just asked in the chat, and I said, what you talk, you walk, and what you walk, you live. Um, so like I said, I'm going to pray over us. Um, and I'm just looking for God to do amazing things because he's working in the every single day, every single moment right? He's counted the hairs on your head. Like, can you imagine how tedious that is for the God of the universe to count the hairs on your head and you shed, I mean, Victoria can probably tell you how many <laughs> hairs a day, right? You know, it's here today, gone tomorrow. It doesn't even matter to you, right? And yet it matters to him. You matter to him. He is calling to you day in and day out. Are you listening? Are you grabbing what he says? Are you reading Proverbs, not just as a father talking to a son, but as your father talking to you as his child? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for just being yourself tonight. Thank you for opening your heart to us, opening your word to us and sharing with us what it is that you desire to say. We pray that you would remind us to open our ears to hear you, open our hearts to receive you, open our understanding that we may experience you more and experience your perspective, that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining tonight. I, um, I would definitely encourage you. Giving is so very important, especially right now, because no matter how open or closed the doors ever are, God's always moving. He's always pulling on us as the church to do more and greater things for him. And we can do those greater things through you. We can do those greater things through your giving. If you're generous with God, he'll always be generous with you. But if you're not generous, you'll never see the rewards he has out of that generosity. So I would encourage each and every one of you to give tonight, to 
um, and Christina just put it in, in the chat, the link to give. Give tonight to a God who's been generous to you so that he can expand his kingdom in the earth. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And I pray you have a blessed night. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Minister Demita. Thank you, ma'am.